Today's lecture is on system properties, invertibility, and BIBO stability. The objective of today's lecture is to define the system properties, invertible and BIBO stability, and to determine if a system is invertible and or BIBO stable. For the last couple of lectures, we have been discussing system properties. The first one was the system based upon linearity, which state that the system satisfies both additive and homogeneous scaling, which means that for an input of alpha one x one of t plus alpha two x two of t, the output of the system will be alpha one y one of t plus alpha two y two of t. In the initial lecture of today's week, we also discussed time invariant, where time invariant states that if you have a shifted input x of t minus t one, then the output will also be shifted and produce y of t minus t one. Last lecture, we determined whether a system was causal or memoryless. Recall that a system is causal if for any time t1, the output response y of t1 resulting from the input x of t does not depend on values of the input x of t for t greater than t1. In other words, the output only depends upon past up to the present value of x. A system is said to be memoryless if for any time t1, the value of the output at t, time t1 depends only on the value of the input at the exact same time t1. There are two special cases for determining linearity and causality when the function is described in terms of a differential equation or an integral. These are particularly useful when you cannot explicitly write the output as a function of the input. For linearity, the way to do this is to form the homogeneous and scaling in the differential equation and then evaluate. For time invariance, you can imply the rule that if there's no initial conditions, and you integrate over all time, then the system is time invariant if it is only a function of the simple input x of t and output y of t with no other functions of time, such as y of t over two, x of t to two t, x of one minus t, t, sine of t, e to the two t, etc. You can also use substitution on the variables of integration to determine whether they are equivalent or not. Let's look at some more examples of determining whether a system is linear and or time invariant when it is described by either an integral or a differential equation. The first system is y of t is equal to the integral from negative infinity to t, lambda e to the negative t minus lambda, x of lambda d lambda. So just like before, we're going to use signal flow graphs. So the first thing we're going to do is to find the output due to the input alpha one x one of t plus alpha two x two of t. So z one of t is equal to the integral from negative infinity to t, lambda e to the negative t minus lambda, and the input is going to be alpha one x one of lambda plus alpha two x two of lambda d lambda. Now remember for z two of t, we find alpha one y one of t plus alpha two y two of t. So I'm going to have alpha one times the integral from negative infinity to t, lambda e to the negative t minus lambda, x one of lambda d lambda, plus alpha two, the integral from negative infinity to t, lambda e to the negative t minus lambda, x two of lambda, d lambda. And you should quickly be able to verify that by splitting z1 into two integrals, it becomes z2. So since z1 equals z2, we say that this system is linear. This is an alternate way for testing linearity than we've seen in prior lectures. What about time invariance? So z1 of t to check for time invariance is going to be the output due to the input shifted by t naught. So this is going to be the integral from negative infinity to t, lambda e to the negative t minus lambda, x of lambda minus t naught d lambda. Z2 of t is going to be the output shifted by t naught, so this is going to be the integral. Everywhere we find a t, you delay it, so it's going to be negative infinity to t minus t naught, lambda e to the negative quantity t minus t naught minus lambda, x of lambda d lambda. 
And as we saw in a prior lecture, we have to use a substitution to confirm that these integrals are actually the same. So what we're going to do is let sigma equal lambda minus t naught. This means that d sigma equals d lambda and that lambda equals sigma plus t naught. And we're going to use these substitutions in z1 of t. So now let's rewrite z1 of t. Z1 of t is equal to the integral from negative infinity to t minus t naught. This becomes t minus t naught because if lambda equals t, sigma equals t minus t naught. And then the exponent, lambda, is going to be lambda e to the negative quantity t minus sigma minus t naught x of sigma d sigma. And what you should quickly be able to verify that z1 and z2 are the same except for the variable of integration, which is sigma for z1 and lambda for z2. So since z1 equals z2, we do have a time invariant system. For our next example, we're going to determine if the system described by the following integral is linear and time invariant. The integral is y of t is equal to the integral from t naught to t 2x of lambda minus 1 d lambda. We'll check linearity first. So the first thing is z1 of t is equal to the integral from t naught to t 2 times the quantity alpha 1 x1 of lambda minus 1 plus alpha 2 x2 of lambda minus 1 d lambda z2 of t alpha 1 times the integral from t naught to t 2 x1 of lambda minus 1 d lambda plus alpha 2 times the integral from t naught to t 2 x2 of lambda minus 1 d lambda and you should quickly be able to see that by dividing z1 into two integrals z1 does equal z2 so we do have a linear system. Now let's check that the system is time invariant. So first, we're going to have the output due to a delayed input. So z1 of t is equal to the integral from t naught to t to x of lambda. And we will use capital T for the delay this time since t naught is part of the integral. Lambda minus 1 minus capital T d lambda. And z2 of t is the output delayed given the input. So this is going to be replacing every t with t minus capital T. So it's going to be the integral from t naught to t minus capital T to x of lambda minus 1 d lambda. And just like before, in order to compare these two integrals and confirm that they are indeed equal, we're going to do a substitution. So we're going to let sigma equal lambda minus t. So d sigma equals d lambda and lambda equals sigma plus capital T. And now let's rewrite z1 of t. z1 of t is equal to the integral from t naught minus capital T to lowercase t minus capital T to x of sigma minus 1 d sigma. And if we compare these two integrals, we see here, which we did an example like this before, that what keeps these two integrals from being equal is the lower limit of integration. Other than that, everything's the same other than the variable of integration. So we can only say that this is time invariant for one of two cases. So this system is only time invariant if one case t naught is equal to negative infinity. If t naught equals negative infinity, we know that they will have the same result. The other way it could be time invariant is only if the initial conditions are zero. And what this means is that x of t is equal to zero for t 
less than T naught. Okay, let's try some examples that involve differential equations and determine if they are linear and time invariant. So what we will use is y dot of t plus 2ty of t equals x of t plus 1. So first, we'll do time invariant. Now based upon our new special cases, we know that this system is not time invariant. And the reason we can say this is because of that function of time that multiplies y of t, which is because of 2t. So there's no analysis to do. It's just immediately, if you see any other functions of time other than simple y of t and x of t, you can immediately determine that it is not time invariant. So the answer is no for that. The way that we determine whether the system is linear is we actually build this differential equation with the scaling and homogeneous factors and see if it results in the same. So what we do here is you replace all of the y's and x's with either alpha 1, y1 of t, plus alpha 2, y2 of t, and you replace all of the y of t's with that, and then all of the alpha 1, x1 of t, plus alpha 2, x2 of t's, replace x of t. Then when you're all done, you rewrite the system with capital Y of T and X of T, and if it yields the same equation, you could say that it's linear. Let's do an example of what I mean. So the first thing, I have Y dot of T. So I'm going to rewrite that as alpha one, Y one dot of T, plus alpha two, Y two dot of T. Then I have plus two T, and in parentheses, I replace this Y of T with the substitution I just showed. So this is alpha one, y1 of t plus alpha 2, y2 of t. And that equals, on the right side of the equation, alpha 1, x1 of t plus 1, plus alpha 2, x2 of t plus 1. So now what you do with this step is you replace all of the alpha 1, y1 of t plus alpha 2, y2 of t terms with capital y of t, and all of the alpha 1, x1 of t, plus alpha 2, x2 of t terms with capital X of t in that last equation. If when I do this, it looks exactly like the original, except now I have capital X and capital Y instead of lowercase x and lowercase y, you say that the system is linear. So let's see an example of what I mean here. So what happens here is I take this term, and I rewrite it as capital Y dot of T plus 2T. I take this term and I rewrite it as capital Y of T and I set that equal to this term on the other side and this term is capital X of T plus one. Since the only difference between the original differential equation and the resulting is that I have capital X and Y instead of lowercase x and Y, you would indeed say that this system is linear. Okay, let's look at another example. Determine if the following differential equation is linear and time of invariant assuming zero initial conditions. Once again, we can immediately use our special cases without doing any detailed analysis to say that this system is time invariant. And we know that it's time invariant because it only involves simple functions of x of t and y of t. And no other functions of time. We can also use one of our special cases to determine that the system is not linear. And we can immediately see this because when the input is zero, there will be an output. Because of the two that adds to the input. So as we had in prior lectures, we immediately see that even if x of t is equal to zero, y is still gonna have an output because that two was there. 
Let's do in-class activity five. Determine if the system described by the following differential equation is linear and time invariant assuming zero initial conditions. y dot of t plus y of t times x of t equals x of t. This is one of our special cases and we can immediately say that this system is going to be time invariant. And we know that it's time invariant because it only involves simple functions of x of t and y and t. Okay. Now let's determine if this system is linear. So just like before, we're going to build the scaling and homogeneous factors inside of the differential equation. So I'm going to have alpha one, y one dot of t, plus alpha two, y two dot of t, plus alpha one, y one of t, plus alpha two, y two of t, multiplied by alpha one, x one of t, plus alpha two x two of t, and that equals alpha one x one of t plus alpha two x two of t. So remember the next step is to take each of those terms, the scaling and homogeneous terms, and rewrite them as a capital X or capital Y. So this term becomes capital y one y dot of t. And this term becomes x of t. The middle term can be rewritten as alpha one squared x one of t y one of t plus alpha one alpha two x one of t y two of t plus alpha one alpha two x two of t y one of t plus alpha two squared x two of t y two of t. And what you can quickly see is that there is no way to rewrite this middle term to just be capital X of T or capital Y of T. So because of this middle term, we say that this differential equation is not linear. All right, let's do one final example of testing a differential equation for linearity and time invariance. Determine if the following system is linear and time invariant assuming zero initial conditions, y dot of t plus sine squared of t y of t equals x of t. This is another special case, so we can immediately say that the system is not time invariant because of that sine squared of t term, which is another function of time. So now let's check for linearity again. So I'm going to build the equations inside of the differential equation. So I'm going to have alpha one, y1 dot of t plus alpha 2 y2 dot of t plus sine squared of t times the quantity alpha 1 y1 of t plus alpha 2 y2 of t and that equals alpha 1 x1 of t plus alpha 2 x2 of t. So the next step is to replace all the alpha 1 y1 terms with capital y dot of t plus sine squared of t and the one in the bracket also becomes capital Y of T equals, and then over here I replace every alpha one X one plus alpha two X two with capital X of T. And I can immediately see that this last differential equation is the same as the one in the problem statement, except I have lowercase and capital Y's. So I can say that this system is indeed linear. A system is invertible if unique inputs produce unique outputs. There is a one-to-one -one relationship between the system input and the system output. In other words, given Y, you should be able to determine X or the exact input. A system is bounded input, bounded output, or BIBO stable if bounded inputs produce bounded outputs. Mathematically, if the magnitude of X of T is less than or equal to M for some finite constant M, then the magnitude of y of t is less than or equal to n for some finite constant n, then the system is bi stable. Let's look at several examples and determine whether they are invertible and or bi stable. So determine if y of t equal to the absolute value of x of t is invertible. The easiest way to determine that this system is not invertible is to look at a numerical example. So here we're going to put in one and negative one. So let's say that x of t was equal to one or x of t was equal to negative one. 
If we send that through your function, you're going to get out that y of t equals one. So you don't know what the input was given that the output was one, so this system is not invertible. Let's look at another example, y of t equals one over x of t. So you can quickly see that no matter what, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the input and output. There is no certain x that will give you the same y. If it's zero, it's undefined. If it's one, it's one. If it's negative one, it's negative one. So you can immediately say that the second example So you can immediately say that the second example, yes, it is invertible. Let's look at in-class activity 10. Determine if y of t equals the sine of x of t is invertible. There is also a quick way to check this one, and this is because we have a cyclical sinusoid here. So there will be several places along the sine wave that will give you the same output. For example, if y of t is equal to one, what was the input? Well, the input could, could be zero, the input could be two pi, et cetera. So since there are two possibilities for the input, given that the output is a one, you would say that this is not invertible. What about y of t equals x squared of t? So once again, let's use our example of x of t is equal to one, or x of t is equal to negative one. When we put this through our system, the output is going to be y of t is equal to one. So you don't know whether the input was one or negative one because they produce the same output. So you would once again say that this is an example of a system that is also not invertible. Let's look at in-class activity 12. y of t equals the square root of x of t. Is there any possible way to get the same output for y given two different inputs for x? And you can immediately see that there is not. So for in-class activity 12, we would say yes, it is invertible. Now let's check Bible stable. Determine if y of t equals e to the x of t is Bible stable. So for example, if the input x of t is less than or equal to m, then the output y of t would be equal to e raised to the m, and that would be less than or equal to some other val value. So we would say that this is yes, Bible stable. What about the cosine of one over x of t? Is this Bible stable? So you know a cosine always oscillates between one and negative one. So even if x of t were equal to zero, which is typically one over x of t undefined, because cosine is constrained to be between one and negative one, any bounded input, even a zero, will produce a bounded output. So this is also, yes, Bible stable. Determine if y of t equal to the integral from zero to t, e to the negative t minus lambda, x of lambda, d lambda is Bible stable. So once again, let's constrain x of lambda. Let's say x of lambda is always going to be less than or equal to n. Then if you rewrote this integral, you would have that y of t is equal to n times the integral from zero to t, e to the negative t minus lambda, x of lambda, d lambda. So as long as you can find the integral here from zero to t, and zero to t is not going to be an integral that's going to blow up like to positive or negative infinity because the integral only goes from zero to t. This is always going to be less than some number m. So you would say, yes, this is also Bible stable. Let's look at in-class activity 12. y of t equals u x of t. Remember, u x of t is our step function. Our step function is always between zero and one. So no matter what value you put in for x, you're going to get out a value between zero and one, so it never grows without bound. So you would say, yes, it is Bible-stable. And for the reasons I just stated, that the output is always between zero and one, if the output is a one, you don't really know what the input was, we can say that the function y of t equals ux of t is not invertible. 
Now let's look at in class activity 13. Y of t equals the cosine of 2 pi t x of t. This is another system we can immediately say is not invertible. And the main re reason why we can say this is because assume that y of t was equal to 1 times x of t, just like we had before. There are several places where the cosine of 2 pi of t gives you a 1 out, so you're not really sure what the input was. Ex same way, even if y of t is equal to 0. There are several ways that x of t, that y of t could be zero. It could be that x of t was zero. It could be that cosine two pi was zero. So for several reasons, it is definitely not invertible. However, let's see if it is Bible stable. Well, let's say x of t is less than or equal to n. That means that y of t would be less than or equal to n times cosine two pi t which is going to be a bounded number m because cosine is between zero and one. So you would say yes, it is bibostable. So because we haven't really seen one, what would be an example of a system that is not bibostable? We actually had one earlier in these examples. In class activity eight is not bibostable. The reason why we could say it's not bibostable it's because let's constrain x of t. Let's say x of t is equal to a zero, all right? It's less than or equal to some n. So then y of t would be one over zero, which we know goes to infinity. So y of t equal one over x of t is an example of a system that's not Bible stable. And this concludes today's lecture on looking at special cases for finding linearity and time invariance and determining if a system is Bible stable or invertible.